Um, the, uh, I'm absolutely brain dead from, uh, from uh, jet lag, and I'm really excited that I don't have COVID, but I'm sick, like regularly sick. So, it's, um, so I'm going to be uh, hitting this hard. Okay. Um, so um, real honor to be here. Uh, uh, it's been I was out at Agracy uh, yesterday, and, and um, uh, Greenway New Zealand's just been doing incredible work. And I actually think what I'm saying, there's a real opportunity for New Zealand to leap ahead of where we are in the uh, in the U.S. Um, so I'll do two things. I'm going to talk a little bit about GreenWave, sort of what our program is and how we're thinking about scaling, but then do something I've never done before, which is sort of talk about all the screw-ups we made. And I made a list on the plane, and there were 32. And so I'm going to give you four, but if you want more of them, they're, they're, they're all sitting in my pocket. But it's really important we, like, lift the veil on this because we're in a community of passion right now around seaweed and we need to switch to a community of practice. And climate solutions are really hard. They're expensive, they're high risk and hard. So I think we really gotta go in with our eyes wide open. And these four things are things that are sort of, we're all talking privately about uh, in the States. So, um, uh, how do I work this thing? There we go. Um, so I'm a, just for those of you who don't know, I'm a fisherman, high school dropout for Newfoundland, Canada, and became, I've been farming the same patch of water for 20 years now outside of, outside of New York, growing a mix of seaweed, mussels, um, and oysters now. That's my, those are my main things still on the farm. And, uh, but then founded Green Wave, what, like six years ago or so? And um, just as a nonprofit, I was kind of lonely growing seaweed, right? Because none of my fishermen would hang out with me anymore or let me go to the same bars because I was growing plants. So, um, uh, so start, start a nonprofit just to train some folks. And it was like, you know, six to eight farmers, local farmers a year. And it was, it was going good. It was fun. But then 8,000 people joined our waiting list at Greenwave, just in the U.S., and then requests in over 100 countries. It just blew up. So we had this... So to step back and think about how are we going to scale and um, sort of uh, take a different route. Um, uh, and we've got three strategies that we're doing now. So we launched a couple months ago the Regenerative Ocean Farming Hub. This hive mind of farmers around the country and around the world sharing their fixes, their pivots, their challenges is just going to be, that's the only way we're going to succeed because it's such a unique place. It's like growing on Mars and under the ocean are the two uh, places. And we know we have to do it because our food system is being pushed out to sea. But I just, you know, we really got to, as a farmer, we're all talking about like, God, it's, it's really hard. It's such high risk uh, year to year. So, and then we do this, that's sort of our online thing. And then we do a lot of straight organizing with farmers, holding events. We just had an event, event of 50 farmers from around the country um, uh, a couple months ago. And, um, uh, it's amazing what's happening there. Those, those farmers teaching each other how to scale. We've got you know, farmers coming down with their boats, helping set up anchors, and also sort of self-organizing. Not against, but like, oh, like, I don't know how to say this. Sort of organizing so that there's a more constructive conversation with investors, with policy folks, with scientists. Um, and that's just been really important that the farmers turn themselves kind of almost into a fist so they can, so their interests are really represented because we're really seeing that what's being left behind in all this is the farmers. So it started, they were the front of the story and then all the capital has gone into processing, research, um, uh, uh, and um, policy work and sort of big environmental work. And, and that's the reason is, is that Capital has decided the highest risk piece of the value chain is farming. Like, there's a reason Monsanto and Cargill don't own the farms. They own the seed, the silos, the tractors, and the market, and then they let the farmers accept all, all the risk. And we really don't want to recreate um, those dynamics. So um, then we have the seaweed source, which is like a forward contracting um, uh, setup where buyers actually have to apply to come in and get access, and they've got to agree to some minimum prices because we're seeing the prices too low and as um, we use the sea seaweed source to do forward contracts and set prices where folks can actually make a make a living mm. then the, the last thing is the kelp can you just wave at me when I'm going to I have no sense of time like at all I don't even know a date like I think it's a different day than home or something I don't know um, so the kelp climate fund and this comes out of the blue carbon work so 
If I had a dollar every time someone talked to me about ecosystem services, blue carbon, nitrogen trading over the last 20 years, I would be the richest man in the room, right? <laughs> and I, like, I understand the excitement. It's you know, amazing stuff and the idea that the market could recognize the positive externalities of those of us that are working in the ocean. I mean, that's like a revolutionary idea. But it's not happening, right? It's too slow. The policy isn't there. The research isn't there. Like, and I hope that the markets take over. But we got, what, like nine years before the planet ends? Like, we got to get kelp in the water now. And so we switched gears and we said, okay, let's just straight out start paying farmers to plant kelp. So they get paid by the foot. Um, it's a $300,000 fund. We just spend it down the whole year. I mean, like, you know, every year we spend it all the way down, down and, and re-raise um, money. It doesn't matter if it doesn't grow, the crop fails. Uh, total honor system. And, uh, but what we get in return is data. And we get incredible data on yields, on quality. Farmers go out and take a, three pictures on their farm once a month, send that in, along with taking physical uh, 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 measurements with like the same tools and stuff like that. And then um, this just gives you a sense. You can pick your species, you know, post your pictures, and then you get some uh, data back on whatever the latest science is. This is always changing based on the new reports. Farmers are using this, interestingly enough, for social license, right? Whereas people are opposing their permits, um, they come in and show the, the positive impacts of their farms in these community meetings. And that wasn't something we thought about, but it was actually the farmers asked for that. Um, and it begins this sort of data traceability, so when the markets take over, so, which means then we can break, you know, shut down the kelp climate fund will have sort of this, this um, uh, funnel of data and set up that, that um, will be able to leverage. We're finding that the best data is actually images. So kelp is the best sensor in the world. If you know how to read it, the coloration, the thickness, what's happening to stipes, the different kinds of biofouling, we can read kelp from around the country and be like, oh, this is what's going on with those waters. This is what yield's gonna look like this year. So everybody's putting in these million dollar sensors and kelp is just like the best sensor out there. So images and AI around images is a place, is the, the sort of frontier where uh, we learn to teach those computers everything that um, as farmers we can see about our eyes. Okay, so um, real, can I set this down? How's this switch, does that work? Um, so how we screwed up, how I screwed up, like uh, this is gonna be depressing I guess, huh? Um, is, um, so uh, first is I got so lost in all the speculative activity. The problem with seaweed is it has so many uses. Biofoul, blue carbon, plastics, you know, like feed. It's like, you can, it's like soy, you can just weave it into everything. The trouble is, is that there's so much of it, the unit economics have not been figured out. So I remember on my boat, I held biofuel. I had a little jar and I saw a machine that did it. So, but that isn't working. Like just because you can make it doesn't mean it works. Because unless you know what the, you can figure out how the price of the kelp and the processing and your labor costs and then the sale out the outside. And there is not one company that I've seen in um, uh, what I'd argue are speculative activities like bioplastics, like biofuel, blue carbon that have figured out the, um, uh, the unit economics, but they can't talk about it because they're all funded by venture capital, they're burning through money. If you tell the real story, the, the next round of funding's not gonna come in. Like this is like, it, the investment world, it's great, but is it, is it applicable to climate solutions and especially growing food underwater? I'm not sure, I think we need more interesting capital stacks and I think it's encouraging a Silicon Valley, fake it till you make it. And like, we gotta get serious about this. And we gotta like grow kelp, process it, get it into bioplastics, get it into our food system, things like that, and right now. And I'm really worried about the culture that's around of like entrepreneurship, picking an entrepreneur, throwing all the money at it, and then them having to just like continually raise money is gonna hold us, hold us back. Um, the, uh, uh, the other thing is, mm, the investors are in total climate denial, right? They believe, they're not like Trump people, but they are using 20th century business models for this. If you think you can make a 7% return in six years, exit strategy, you're just like, 
and make sure you're drawing down carbon while lifting up communities, all this sort of rhetoric, there's just no way, right? The margins aren't, aren't there. So we see a lot of huge amount of time wasted um, as investors come in. It's all exciting, we get down, down, and then like all the deals break up when the accountants, like down at that last inch of deals. And then what they do is the folks that are sort of truth telling on, on, on um, uh, where the industry is, a lot of that capital then shifts to highly speculative activity where you, the promises of a 10x return are there. Yeah, of course you've replaced all plastics on the entire globe with seaweed, right? You'd, someone would make some money, right? But the question is that, is that there, is that where the money needs to be deployed now? Or why can't we deploy it strategically across the industry? And I think the tech sector and the hedge, I don't mean to be tough on investors, right? They're, they fund Greenwave and stuff, but um, uh, I just think there's like, climate denial is granular. We're all in it. And we just need to think about what in our own systems we need to change. Like as a fisherman, like I can't chase fish anymore. Right? I gotta change my life. That's my, like, and just acknowledge that climate change is real and start shifting. So all the other sectors need to um, do that. The other thing is, um, you know, ag, so you come out of technology, you've done an app, you've come out of a hedge fund, you make money off of money. But like, agriculture is so different, right? It's infrastructure heavy, it's low margin, right? You're, you're building, you're creating things, and there's just not much profit there. Like, every farming system in the world is subsidized, right? And so, um, uh, like, and farmers don't want equity deals. They don't want um, big chunks of money. What they want is like, we use the words, I think, revenue-based uh, financing a little different in the States. I heard it here, but um, uh, things like forgiv forgivable loans, you know, um, loans that get paid back when you start making money and there's no equity involved and it's like a two or three percent return, like the ultimate, like, that's the kind of money that a, that a farmer needs. And if you look at the ecosystem, like hatcheries, you're never gonna make money. They're gonna be a nonprofit. There's a reason hatch, fish hatcheries in Alaska are a nonprofit, right? Just not, my view is I'm working, I run a hatchery. Farms, low margin, an amazing life, soul filling, luckiest people in the world, right? Doing something concrete and real and not caught in the cubicle class, right? Then there is money to be made in processing and value added products. But like if you move one piece of the chessboard at the wrong time, none of it works. Like the big, the folks that have, have um, uh, raised a huge amount, amount of money to process stuff, they can't get enough supply because they can only pay six cents a pound. All right, so like they, here you move, you've moved the processing technology this way, but like, you know, in another place there are not enough hatcheries so farmers can't get enough seed to grow. So you, what's beautiful about the New Zealand What's the plan, the seaweed framework? I think I read it um, the other day. It's brilliant because it does have that kind of planning behind it, and we didn't do that um, in the States. I'll probably come to the end. Let me run through. Uh, um, here's, and let me apologize to the, to the scientists right now. Um, and I've got incredible scientists on my board, Charlie Yarriston. Like Dr. Seaweed um, is, is on Greenwave staff, but um, scientists are great gardeners, not farmers. And we didn't know that. So I have so much data about my farm. Ecosystem services, carbon, it's just like reams and reams of stuff has never helped me farm and farm it at scale, right? Um, and so the real worry here, and the other thing is, you know, I mean, let's be honest about scientific and research funding. It's entrepreneurial in its own way. You gotta chase the next thing and the next problem rather than like dig in and how do you go from 500,000 pounds on 20 acres to a million pounds and deal with nutrient shading in the center of the farm, right? And then do it for five years, right? Because you don't know if your farm is successful. Five years, like the lack of research on yields, quality, consistency, um, uh, are just like, we need the research so well, so deeply, I mean desperately amongst farmers, but you need to listen to the farmers about what's actually needed. And there's class issues here, and there's PhDs and all this sort of stuff, but applied science in the water is hard. It can't be episodic, it can't be one season. It needs to be deep, and you need eyes on that water and that, that project every single day every day, because the ocean's just like so volatile, 
right? And so the data we are getting back is just kind of, honestly, it just is, it, I, I wouldn't peer review it. Like if I was asked on the peer review board, I'd be like, nah, right? But they never asked me, I don't know. Um, <laughs> then um, I, the last thing, and then I'll, I'll close up, mm, is um, when you're trying to build an industry like this from, um, not from scratch, but trying to go from something that is much smaller to something that is, really has economic impact, employs a lot of people, and can really move the needle on climate change, um, you need to have a, we found, that you really need to have a pre-competitive framework. So the, at, in the states what happened is everybody was talking about working together, but it was a scarcity mindset. Like if they succeed, we won't. If they get this money, we won't. And, and you know, and press, and I understand all that, but the problem is with that mindset, everybody fails. Because everybody's making the same mistakes, they've built walls and not sharing. And this is among some of the biggest kelp companies in the world and the, the smallest. It's amongst farmers, processors, hatcheries, across the board. And um, uh, in this first stage, we need pre-competition so that at some point we can compete. So there is a stage of, that we went through in the US which was, um, I think of as a, as a fictional stage. When it was excitement, money, discussion, talk, love, like all this enthusiasm. Um, uh, but it wasn't real yet. And then, and in the fictional stage, a lot of the partnerships begin to, to fall apart. A lot of the ill will, the competitive mindset, undermining, and it got kind of very toxic. Now this is, this is in the States, and we're able to turn everything toxic. So like 90% <laughs> of what I'm saying here does not apply to anywhere else. It's just in my horrible, horrible country. Um, um, but I I, it, it's really, really slowed that process of building walls has really slowed down the development. It's been heartbreaking. A ton of money's been wasted because of the walls and everybody making mis uh, mistakes. And so what we saw was this fictional stage and then sort of a creative non-fiction stage where you're doing pilots and really trying to figure it out. Between fiction and this uh, creative non-fiction stage, there's a reorganization of partners. A Bunch of people fall out. Other people sort of stay in the speculative fictional fake it till you make it sphere, but like a group gets serious about pilots, but the pilots are harder than you think because you realize how t hard it is to grow food underwater. Um, so it's slower, right? So, you, so um, which is harder for fundraising. And then when that's successful, it moves to commercial pilots. And that's where you're getting serious about numbers. And that's very often yet another reorganization of partnerships and money and funding. And then you get into true commercialization. Um, and um, each one of those uh, looks very, very different. And the, the trick is, is how do you retain your coalition? Because everybody's needed, it's all hands on deck through all those, uh, through those stages. So keep it healthy and happy. So that's what I gotta say. Again, ignore 90, 95% of it. Not applicable, but okay. <laughs>